You're listening to Cloud Security Reinvented, a podcast for security leaders with a focus on the cloud. Learn best practices from fellow security professionals and how they disconnect from it all at the end of the day. Cloud Security Reinvented. Good morning, or depending on when you are in the world, good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Welcome to Cloud Security Reinvented. I'm your host, Andy Ellis. Before I introduce our guest for the week, a quick word from our sponsor, Orca Security. Orca provides agentless security and compliance for your public cloud infrastructure, enabling you to detect and prioritize security risks in minutes, not months. Thank you, Orca. I'm here with Dan Walsh, CISO of Village MD. Welcome, Dan. Thanks, Andy. It's good to be here this, today. Well, thanks for joining us today. Across a career, you know, we as professionals grow and the world that we're in is changing. So today we're going to get some insight from you, especially as we look at the transition that's happened over the last decade or two from the on-premise world that I think a lot of us started our careers in to the world of cloud that has become the default model for IT infrastructure. So I want to talk a little about your career journey to begin with. You got your start really at Vanguard in business operations, but then you moved into information security at United Health Group. So that transition must be interesting. You, know, you changed career fields and you changed industries. And what was that like for you? Great question. So I actually started my career at Vanguard as a data miner and you know very quickly understood the power that a data could, like a story that data could tell. Mm -hmm. And was able to get actually some really great, what I would say, kind of professional and work-related accomplishments from some of the insights that we derived from that data, including saving like real money, hard dollars for the company at the time. And because of that, it opened up a lot of opportunities to kind of move into almost like a chief of staff role in our technology, on the technology side of the house, in operations. It was essentially like a chief of staff role that, that had everything to do with like developing applications and implementing new systems. And so that's where the operations term came from. They really didn't have a good a good title for that. <laughs> yep. But I but I pretty much did everything. I did the metrics for the principal of the department. I did back in the day it was called SAS seventy. So Oh my so god, look, I remember that. Yep. So looking at the controls that we had in our environment for our regulators and auditors. And then also looking at what were some of the security aspects that we need to kind of stay on top of as an organization. And then in 2008, we had the whole Lehman Brothers, like the crash in September, if you all remember that. And I realized that I was working at Vanguard. All my money was at Vanguard. My wife's job was at Vanguard. All her money was at Vanguard. And I decided that I wanted to diversify my life a little bit. And also, I, I, wanted, I was excited about moving into what I think are the three, um, the three most interesting fields or industries which in my opinion are telecommunications, healthcare and technology, because I think that even today, right, and mm -hmm. this is like years later, those are the industries with the most opportunity. So I really targeted a search around companies in those industries, and the first company that came along with a great opportunity was United Health Group, and I transitioned into being a project manager, leading large multi-million dollar technology and security projects. Did that for about a year, brought home some really poorly managed projects that I had inherited and turned them around. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that year, because United had a time and job requirement of a year before you can move on, I had multiple options at a director level. And my boss said, well, why don't we create a role for you here? What do you want to do? And I said, I would like to lead mobile and web application development for our particular like, department that we had. Yep. And so opened up that role and was always very passionate about making sure that our the, the applications that we developed were secure which caught the attention of our security team. And then eventually I transitioned into kind of work on the security team at Health Group, which kicked off my security career. That's an amazing sort of transition and insertion into the security career field. And I think too many people think about the way into security is always at the bottom. Like how do I get a job with eyes on glass and don't think about, oh, demonstrate interest in security and move laterally almost to the same job, but on the other side of the house. That's right, because I think what people don't realize that are outside of security is inside of security is extraordinarily messy. And so if you're looking at a business unit or a technology group that has security like really under wraps and squared away, you're like, wow, I, I actually want to bring that into my team 
into right. the security team. If I can find an engineering team that scans their source code for open source vulnerabilities that make sure that their cloud infrastructure access and vulnerabilities are managed very well, like I'm going to pull those people into my, I want them. I mean, they're, right, they're you basically- you have to figure out how they evangelized it within their correct. organization so yes. you evangelize it to everyone. That's right. How do we spread the goodness? Yeah. No, I love yep. that. I think often we think about how do we take good security people and push them into the organization to be better levers, but we don't often think about bringing them in to improve yep. our own capabilities. You know, it's probably a, a little arrogant blind spot many of us have in the security field. It is, and I think it's natural a bit because 90% of the time that is the case. 90% of the time we feel like we're the only ones that are concerned about this. We're the only ones yep. that understand the control environment. We're the only ones that are worried about the fact that we flagged a critical vulnerability for our business and it's been 30 days and they haven't done anything with it. Mm -hmm. um, or maybe longer, hopefully not. But it puts, a lot of times it is, right? If we're being yeah. honest. If we're being honest, and, sometimes yeah. it's years. Yeah, if we're being honest, it could be like, you know, 365 days. And so, yeah, I think, you know, whenever you find that, it's very attractive and, and it really opens up opportunities for people who are trying to get their foot in the door. I think yep. the people that are like, I'm just going to do my day job and get a bunch of certifications or go get a mastery in cybersecurity, but not actually apply security in the job at where they're at are really doing themselves a disservice. That's really fantastic insight. I like that. You then spent over 10 years now in the healthcare industry at United, then at Rally, now at Village MD. You know, how have you seen security change as cloud became prevalent across that transition? I would say that security in the last 15 years for sure and some of the last 10 has been moving away especially in healthcare where at first it felt like it was very we have our policies we have our administrative controls we'll do a pen test annually we've got a sock we've got a knock mm -hmm. more to we need to make sure that security is really integrated with technology we need, we need to make sure that security is really integrated with the cloud and not only that but also making sure that we've got integration across security domains so our my grc team is very well aware and has feedback loops into our security operations team or into my DevSecOps team. So we really have those integration points because, you know, without that in healthcare, it's very easy to default to a compliance led, a compliance oriented program because of HIPAA and because of the state's regulations around healthcare as well. So I would say that, and I would say also that healthcare has been a bit of a, a low or slow adopter to the cloud as compared to some of the other industries. But I do think that because of the, focus on rising costs and trying to keep the cost down, it's inevitable and yep. it is happening. And, and I would say it's a, we're over halfway there easily, in my opinion, from where I'm looking at, uh, nine, of course, non scientifically and just informally, but I would say that in order to run a large healthcare company at scale these days, you have to start in the cloud. You can't start on private, just financial doesn't make any sense. Well, that's great to see, because I think we're, a lot of us are used to healthcare being the the really far laggards, you know, we feel like it's often 30 years behind. But how do you see cloud security in your industry that would be surprising to those of us who aren't on the inside? Like, I look from the outside and I probably have a lot of preconceptions. How am I wrong? Well, you're probably not wrong. Healthcare, again, is the investment in security has come a long way in healthcare. Mm -hmm. I still think it has some, some room to grow and to continue and improve, especially as I would say starting probably four years ago, you started to see a rise in these cloud incidents yep. and that's going to continue. So whatever is, how much work do I have to put in to realize a reward from a bad actor point of view? Mm -hmm. And so that's going to continue. I would say though, that I, I do think that I've seen a lot of hospital systems that have very forward thinking security and technology leaders making these massive pushes to the cloud. I would say on the payer side, the insurance companies are already there. A lot of them are trying to get these like really legacy claim systems that have been around since literally like the 1980s. Yes. And it's super expensive to make that transition, but they're really trying to think creatively and strategically about, okay, this is an extraordinarily expensive thing to transition, but how do we do this and spread this out over time so we can make that transition, recognizing that once we are able actually to do that, there'll be a tremendous amount of cost savings. But this is a probably a 10 year, 15 year, 20 year journey for healthcare in particular with those large systems, but with the healthcare industry consolidating and you have hospital systems getting bigger, provider practices mm -hmm. getting larger, they're recognizing that all these little like servers sitting in some closet or under someone's desk somewhere, it's just not sustainable because we can't track them, we can't patch them, we can't manage them in a mm -hmm. coordinated fashion. And so 
right now the industry is going through this whole painful transition of trying to get those up into the cloud and manage them formally. I think we've all had that horror story of the person who departs, leaves the server running under their desk, and six months later, somebody turns it off when somebody else gets assigned that desk. Although maybe in the COVID era, it'll be a year and a half instead of six months before somebody shows up at that desk. Well, and you're being kind to say it's a tower under someone's desk. Sometimes it's a laptop. That's true. <laughs> Those are always worrisome. Yeah. So that, that sort of drives into the, as you move into the cloud, you know, there's a lot of practices that are you know, 10, 20 years old that we always indoctrinated into people. You know, which ones of those most resonate for you? You say, as we go into cloud, we need to remember or not forget to do X, but X is the thing we've always talked about. I would say access control and asset inventory. Okay. It has to be like, to me, it's like the top two. I know that obviously vulnerability management is there as well, but I'd be curious to hear your experience. In my experience, I've seen more problems with cloud incidents with knowing what is in my cloud infrastructure yeah. and knowing who has access to it versus something wasn't patched in the cloud. Yeah, it's also sometimes the, the server that gets added right next to a production system that has access to it, but you don't That's even right. know that Correct. that system exists. Correct. Yep. Yeah, that's definitely yep. uh, in there. So yep. let's take the flip side. What practice that we've done for a long time should we have buried and gotten rid of already? But today's the best day compared to yesterday. So this is going to sound really detailed and really silly. But okay. one thing that we still see pop up from companies in the healthcare system is like, we want the right to inspect or the right to be notified when you're moving to cloud infrastructure. Mm hmm. Well, it's like you're not going to inspect GCP or Azure AWS's like server building yep. wherever that's located at. I also don't think that it's really necessary to notify them when, when they're making a change like that because I just don't know what value that adds other than creating overhead for the team. So that's definitely one, even if it's a if it's a very specific one. I think another one is I think another one is how we think about like you know the annual pen test. Yep. Again, I would probably focus more on a maybe like an access review or some configuration scan that I would like to see versus like a pen test. I think pen tests are helpful, but again, understanding where a lot of your cloud mistakes and breaches are occurring, you need to focus more on like the configuration in my opinion. Right. right. Are you sort of continuously making sure everything's up to snuff rather Correct. than waiting for an outsider to find the thing that you know, if you were looking, you would have noticed already? Yeah, and one thing that we haven't really done a great job of is we don't have a great way of getting third-party assurance that our vendors are doing these continuous monitoring activities. Yep. And I think and that's vendors are not transparent on that at no, all. No, absolutely not. And I'll admit as a former vendor on that side that I always loved it when people asked for, you know, can you tell us every time you make a change? And yeah. I was like, do you really want to do that? Because I'm making thousands a day. Right. I'm happy to set up a cron job to just email you you right. every five seconds with, hey, we've made a change, have a nice day. Exactly. I hear you on that one. So let's look at just this whole, the transition to cloud and what surprised you the most or that you see as a big growth opportunity that maybe would surprise others that if you go back to pre-cloud, you didn't anticipate. I guess I didn't anticipate that um... I should have, I think we all should have, but I didn't anticipate that cloud made it easier for people to just push buttons without knowing what they were doing. Like if I yep. have a credit card, I can spin up an AWS environment in 10 minutes, actually less than that. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that I know what I'm doing with it. And I yep. think there was this sense of it's in the cloud, so it's secure because no one knows what data center it's actually at. And it's gonna be super hard to find out where my infrastructure is running. And so therefore it'll be hard for someone to get into it. We replaced the, and I'll just say like the people that actually built the data center and ran the cabling and put in the server racks, mm -hmm. in some cases, engineers who are really good at development, but maybe not so good at infrastructure and just gave them a credit card and they started pushing buttons, which resulted in like, it seemed like there was a delay of like two years or so. And then all of a sudden everyone realized, oh man, our cloud yep. infrastructure is in a terrible place. And that didn't, su what surprised me wasn't that that occurred. What surprised me was that people were surprised by that. <laughs> right? Because now you've made it to where you can be an expert in one discipline, but now you can basically build an entire application from your computer without really having to understand, in particular on the cloud infrastructure side, how infrastructure should operate. Yeah, I think there's a related one right there that also, 
I'm not sure if surprise is the right word for me, which is when we went to cloud, I thought of cloud as just being other person's data center. Mm -hmm. Right. So to me, I logically transpose like, oh, the routers will still be there. The network wires will still be there. And I never really considered the infrastructure as code oh, okay. capabilities that cloud you know, brings us to say, no, no, no. You just can assemble these pieces almost like visual basic, like what talks to what. And I think some of the capabilities there, I think, are still surprising people with how we don't have to have a data center oriented architecture in the same way that we used to design them. Right, that serverless yep. is now a real thing. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. I hadn't considered that, but yeah, that, I definitely yeah. that that also surprised people. It's yeah. related because I think we had that same. We were so fixated on the infrastructure, we were surprised that people were surprised that that was a skill. Yeah, but I think I'm surprised that that's a skill that has different uses than just do it virtually instead of physically. Well, and it's a skill that that often in my I don't know about your experience, but in my experience, it's not originating in the infrastructure or the networking team. It's originating in the engineering team. Yes, right. It's moved into those locations now. Yep. yep. So if you look back on your career, and I, I love just that, those transitions, is there a piece of advice that you wish someone had given you earlier in your career or earlier than you got it that would have been helpful to you? I mean, I guess... I don't know. I mean, I will tell you, I've been very fortunate to get great advice along the way, and I'm happy to share some of that. Um, Absolutely. I just to give some background, you know, I grew up, I did not grow up with internships, like in college and high school, I grew up working on a cow farm, I learned how to do everything from welding to harvesting crops to I could stud a wall and build a house, pour concrete, I did not know how to, it was very interesting computers, and I played around with them a lot, but I, I didn't have any sort of formal training. And so I have an MBA, but I got that after I graduated from undergrad. And so going into the workforce, I was very green. I just knew how to work hard and I knew yep. how to be curious. And my first manager at United Health Group, her name was Cecilia. And she taught me a lot. She taught me how to be tough. She taught me how to be direct, how to get to the brass tacks on the bottom line. I remember when I first started with her, she would say, you have to have coins in the bank with me, meaning like you yep. have to like earn my trust. And so that was a huge lesson to like build trust with people because really that's what security is all about. Like a lot of people complain about like, how do I get into security? And so-and-so just hired their friend and I really wish they would have hired me because I think I might be more qualified. And I think what people miss is like that trust, you don't have trust with them. Yep. And since we're in the business of trust, that's why it might feel like sometimes it's a club. When in reality, it's not because the reality of it is, is I'm, am I going to hire somebody that I trust? Or am I going to hire somebody that I don't trust? And nine times out of 10, that's the, not a hard question to answer. Yep. And so Cecilia's advice to me was, you know, work hard, be excellent and build trust. Assume that there is no trust. Like it was almost like she taught me about the concept of zero trust relation <laughs> from a relationship point of view. Yeah. But it's very true. And then the other thing that she told me was, and this is back in the day when your Cisco phone would ring and you'd see the person's name, right? And she would say, when that name lights up, what's the first thought you have in your head? So if you're calling somebody, so if I'm calling Andy Ellis yep. and you see Dan Walsh pops up, are you groaning? Are you being like, oh, Dan, I love that guy. Let's see what he's up to. Are you saying, I mean, now when people see my phone, it's probably like, oh, my God, what incident is, or what's going on now, right? Yep. I used to have a peer who who said every time he answered the phone, he's like, what's wrong? Yeah, exactly. But it's a very important to build relationships prior to there being a problem. Yep. And so I would say, you know, that's probably the other thing. And then the one thing that I've just done as a good practice, which has benefited me tremendously, mm -hmm. that I would advise people is, you don't have to be the expert in the domain that you're managing, but I would say that you need to get more than an inch deep in it yep. in order to make sure you hire the right person for it. So I don't go an inch deep in DevSecOps. I can go probably six inches deep. I can't go a mile deep, mm -hmm. but I can go six inches deep. And I can ask the right questions to know to hire someone who's an all-star. Security operations, I can go probably very deep in security operations because I'm a little more familiar with that. Application development, go very deep. But you have to understand the level of depth that you need to get to in order right. to, to have the right team under you. Yeah, and then you have to know where your depth stops and you need to trust when the people beneath you say that you're wrong about something, right? That your mental model Correct. doesn't apply. And that's, that's right. I think, a, a challenge for a lot of folks. But I really like the coins in the bank model around trust, because I often think about it just in terms of success execution, which is, you know, I tell everybody I know who does a job transition, like in your first 90 days, anything you deliver lets you deliver more things over the next year. Correct. But I like to think about it as trust also, building up trustworthiness, not just reliability. Right. Yeah. So when you think about the future of technology, 
right? You know, which has built up a lot of coin in our bank, I think. What are you most excited about looking forward over the next five or 10 years? And that can be like in your career field or anywhere. So there's one thing that I'm very passionate about solving and it's a buzzword, so I'm probably embarrassed to even say it, but I am very interested in solving the software supply chain problem. Yep. To me, first party risks that we generate in our business versus third party risks that we inherit because we rely on third parties. I think what we're going to see if we're successful will be the decentralization of all that. And essentially what we need to think about security is we're all first party. And I think the reason why that doesn't happen a lot today is because if I'm working with a partner, I'm either a customer or a vendor, depending on which way the money's flowing, the other side does not want to admit like, hey, this is where I've got vulnerabilities. This is where I have weaknesses in my program. This is where I need to mature. And if we all kind of took a step back and realized like everybody has that thing, even, yep. even companies that are throwing, bil like I'm talking billions, Andy, billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. There are Fortune 10 companies that spend over multiple billions of dollars a year in security yep. that still have major problems. Oh, absolutely. Right? And so it, 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 employing hundreds and thousands of people. And so I think if we were we would just understand kind of where that risk is coming from, I think it would make the business a better partner. And I think it would make these first and third party relationships a lot stronger. And we would have more of a sense of camaraderie and kind of like community ownership of the security problems that we have. And so I think that some of the software supply chain stuff, if it's solved properly, we'll do some of that because it's going to require a level of transparency that we don't currently have right now. Yep. And so I'm pretty excited about that. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised on your perception that the, the sort of the bigger they are, the, the bigger their issues are. My experience as coming out of a very large vendor is that the bigger a company is, the more likely it is to isolate how it does third party risk management from the business. Right. And so they're so fixated on, you know, do you meet this standard bar that they don't even ask the question of, and how are we going to use this technology and how are we exposed to it? And I would have banks that would spend, I don't even want to think about how many people hours or really people years every year auditing and assessing and they never said, oh, hey, look, we're passing around a login token in clear text in a URL string that's dropping into a log file. And you're like, as soon as we spot that, you know, we're the ones who bring it up, but the third party risk management team never would have spotted it because they'd separated that out because it was happening at such scale that they had a dedicated team just to do audit Correct. around that. Correct. Yeah. So this is a stressful career field. Like we got a lot of stuff we have to worry about. How do you unwind and get away from that stress and recharge yourself? Well, I have a young family. I've got yep. a two-year-old son, a four-year-old son, a six-year-old daughter, and a lovely so wife. So the work might wife. be the unwinding place. <laughs> you know what? They're different stress stressors yep. in different ways. And so I love spending time with my kids. I love watching mm -hmm. them, teaching them how to play like sports or board yep. games or whatever. So I like to do that. I've recently, recently, and hopefully I'll stay on the wagon, have been working out more and exercising. Awesome. Uh, and so that makes me feel really good, even if it is late at night, you know, after the kids are in bed. What's your exercise um, of choice? Right. So I, right now I'm doing, a, I have like those Bowflex, like 90 pound dumbbells that are adjustable. And so yep. I just do that and like push ups and pull ups and. Okay, great. Some you know, basic strength workout. training yep. and Pilates. Yep. Fantastic. Yep. Yep. We've got a treadmill. So I'll walk or run on that, but just trying to get back into it. I have a milestone birthday tomorrow, actually. Happy um, birthday. Thank you. Thank you. So it's so, good uh, to turn 30. <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> 10 more years. So yeah, that, that's been good. But yeah, I, I'd say I do that. I really love reading. I love history. Mm -hmm. um, so either reading or, or watching a documentary with an interesting perspective is always good as well. And then I do like going back to my farm days. I do like landscaping and gardening and things like that. So you might find me out in my yard planting a vegetable garden or a flower garden yeah. or something like that. Yeah, I got a raised vegetable garden right outside my window here. So I'm familiar with that. Mostly I just watch it. My wife's the one who does the hard work there. <laughs> nice, I just nice. eat the produce out of it. Very cool, very cool. So before we wrap up, is there any piece of wisdom we didn't cover that you would like to share with our listeners? Doesn't even have to be about technology. Great question. So I would say understand how the individual domains within your business or within your security team or within your technology team understand how they interact with each other and what the feedback loops are. Yep. And the more feedback loops and the more interactions that you can understand and perceive, the better off that you'll be in having kind of like an integrated like approach on things. If you're a security professional or you want to get into security and you think that GRC has nothing to do with 
engineering or application security or security operations, or you think security operations has nothing to do with governance or it has nothing to do with application development, then you're really missing a great opportunity to really understand how how security works. Because at the end of the day, security is really uh, a business function that's really woven throughout the organization. And if you can understand those feedback loops, you'll really understand how security works and you'll be able to be a, a really good security leader either on the security team or outside of the security team. It doesn't necessarily have to be inside. Yep. So I love that. That's uh, great to think of security as a complex system. So with that, we'll wrap ourselves up. So Dan, thanks for joining us. Listeners, we really do appreciate you dropping in. You can subscribe to us on all of your favorite platforms, whether it's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, uh, wherever that's going to be. And we'll see you on the other side. Thank you very much. Thank you for checking out this episode of Cloud Security Reinvented, brought to you by Orca Security. Orca Security detects and prioritizes cloud security risks for AWS, Microsoft Azure, and Google Cloud without the gaps in coverage, alert fatigue, and operational costs of agents. Please follow Cloud Security Reinvented wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts or visit orca.security slash podcast to get immediate access to all of the latest episodes.